Hi there. My name is Katherine Riley Parker, and I'm a paper artist at Sproul Gallery. And I'm here today in my studio to talk to you about my work. I specialize in a paper process called quilling, which really has been around probably since paper was invented. It involves using strips of paper and forming them into shapes and then using those shapes to create a larger design. So when you do quilling, you're actually using paper as the medium for a piece of artwork. I'd like to show you some examples of the different types of work that I do because for each type, I use a slightly different set of materials. I'll start with these three by three inch magnets that I make using a mini canvas. And these are the smallest type of work that I make. For these smaller projects, I use a pre-cut quilling paper that is one eighth of an inch wide and anywhere from 14 to 24 inches long. You can see that these um, strips are quite thin and flexible. So they're really ideal for creating very detailed elements of work. So for example, if you look at the eyes on this dragonfly, those are tiny little rolled circles. Um, you really need a thin, flexible piece of paper to be able to create something like that. When I get into larger pieces that are intended as wall hanging pieces, uh, another type of work I do quite often is a shadow box. And I've got a few examples of these here. These range in size from about five by seven to about 12 by 12 inches. And for these, I like to use a different type of paper that's a little heavier than the pre-cut strips. And the downside is that means I do have to cut the strips myself, but it gives me a little more flexibility in the type of paper I can use and also in how wide the strips are. And the type of paper that I use for this is made by Canson. It's a high quality art paper that's available in art stores or online. And it comes in sheets and a good range of color. Um, these are a couple of strips that I've cut from some Canson paper. So I'll hold these in my left hand and in my right hand, you can see one of the pre-cut strips I showed you before. The pre-cut strip is quite a bit more uh, flexible. It's thinner, whereas these have a little more substance and weight. They're not quite as flexible since it's a heavier weight paper. The reason I do like to use these wider strips in a heavier paper in a larger project like a shadow box is because it gives the piece a little more depth. That seems to me to be more in scale with the larger size. So if you look at this initial kind of from an angle, you can see that the paper comes up quite a bit from the surface that it's adhered to. And I also like this heavier paper kind of lends itself to a more open style of quilling, which is a little more contemporary looking. So I like that about it as well. A third type of work that I do that is actually my specialty is this monochromatic quilling using an off-white or creamy white paper. And I've done this work in a range of sizes from five by five inches up to 36 by 48 inches. And here are a few examples of this work in kind of a medium range of sizes. The paper that I use for these projects is a 100% cotton watercolor paper from France called Arches or Arche. You'll hear it pronounced both ways. Um, this comes in either blocks of paper, like you see here, or you can buy it by the sheet. Um, over here, I've got a sheet that's about 22 by 30 inches. And in my closet, I've even got a roll that's 10 yards long for big projects where I need a very large work surface. The reason I like this paper, even though it's very expensive, is that it's what's called archival quality, meaning that it's designed to hold its appearance and its integrity over time. It's acid-free and lignin-free, meaning that it doesn't have the chemicals in it that can cause some papers to turn brittle or yellow over time, like an old newspaper. And that's really important when I'm working in this white color because I don't want it to turn yellow with age. And that will not happen with this archival quality paper. The other thing I like about this paper is it's heavier weight. So compared with the papers I've been showing you up to now, you can see this one has even more body to it. You can probably even hear that it has a little more body as I move it around. And that makes it a little more challenging to work with on a more detailed level, but it also lends itself to larger and more open designs where I wanna create more texture and dimensionality. 
The palm tree, uh, well, let me show you an example where I've used both cut paper and quill paper techniques from this Arsh paper. I cut the leaves by hand from pieces of the paper uh, using a very small pair of curved scissors to cut out each frond of the leaf. And then in the trunk, I used a couple of different quilling techniques. Each of these segments in the trunk was created using a strip of the paper and then that was used to create a quilled circle. And then on the sides, some additional strips were used to create the little strolls. One thing I do like about this monochromatic work is that it lets me as an artist and you as a viewer kind of focus on more dimensional elements like texture and shadows and shapes. And sometimes those elements get lost if there's a lot of color in the work, whereas in a monochromatic work, that's really what you're focusing on. So I like that about this type of work. One question I'm asked a lot is how long it takes to create a piece of quilling. It takes about six to eight hours per square foot because there are a lot of steps involved. So I'll take you through a few of those steps for a piece like the pineapple or the starfish that you see in the back of this counter here. I usually start with my white art pieces. I start with a wooden panel, and my favorite brand is these ampersand panels. They have a very nice, consistent quality, and I like the look and feel of them. It's kind of a natural wood that goes well with the nature themes that I often use. Once I take that out of the wrapping, I always start by sealing the panel with um, a sealant because I don't want the wood panel to come into direct contact with the paper that will be applied to it. And then once the piece has been sealed, I adhere a piece of the white arch paper to the front of it. And to do that, I use a PVA adhesive, which is archival quality to do that. And then once it's dried, I trim it to the shape of the panels. My next step is usually to apply some sort of additional texture to form a nice background for the piece. So if I'm doing a sea-oriented piece, an ocean-oriented piece like this panel for a turtle, um, I've started by putting some additional embellishment on there with paper, and I've also used some sand and gel to give it some additional texture and kind of evoke that ocean feel. If I'm working on a project where I will have to cut my own paper strips, I'd like to do that in advance and get it all done before I actually start the quilling. So I'm lucky in my studio to have a lot, of, a lot of flat surfaces where I can leave these paper cutters set up because I do use those constantly. Um, this one that I'm on here now is a rotary cutter that lets me cut strips up to about 18 inches in length. And if I'm working with a larger piece of paper for larger projects, and I need more area, I can move over to this rotary cutter on this mat and use that with a straight edge to get a nice clean cut with this rotary cutter. The actual quilling itself I usually do at this island workspace because it's nice and large and flat. When you're gluing paper, you do need a horizontal workspace rather than a more vertical easel like when you're painting. So again, I'm lucky to have this nice island to work at. And since it's separate from our living area, I don't have to worry about cleaning it up at the end of each day. The other thing I need is lots of strong light since I'm working with so much small detail. So I do have several uh, spotlight types of lamps set up on the island. The tools that I actually use in quilling are pretty compact. In fact, I can fit most of them into a couple of eyeglass cases. But the most important one, of course, is my quilling needle. And this is a little slotted needle with a handle. And so the slot lets you insert a strip of your quilling paper right into the slot and then start turning it. And once you have that formed into a circle, you can Get it to a particular size. A lot of times when you're quilling, you want to have a number of pieces that are the same size. So if you were doing the petals of a flower, you might want a series of 10 millimeter pieces. And so this quilling board lets me insert the rolled piece into a little template that's in this case, 10 millimeters wide. And so I can get a series of those going for the same pattern. Um, getting those out can be tricky, so typically I will use tweezers to do that. 
that lets me reach in there and get it out once it's in the right size. My glue bottle is extremely important. I use a little fine line uh, tip glue bottle that I put my glue into and this lets me get a very tiny drop of glue that you need to work with, especially on these more delicate pieces. So tweezers are important. Um, my small scissors are important. I have a straight pair and a curved pair that I use quite a bit. Um, stylus and needle, these are useful for pushing small pieces into shape in, within a design. And then there are some types of quilling that use combs to make the design. Um, so I do also have an assortment of combs. So those are my basic quilling tools. When I'm working on a design, usually I'll start by making a lot of the shapes that I know I'll need in the design. And I'll make those in advance so that I've got them ready to work with. Um, these are just a few of the shapes that I use in a design like this pineapple, which you can see has several different sizes going on. So I would need to make several different sizes for those. Um, so sometimes I'll glue onto another piece of paper, as in this case, I've got a background that is the turtle shell and that I've done my quilling on top of that. And then as my final step, I will adhere this piece to a board that I've prepared earlier, like so. The final step in preparing a piece is getting it ready to actually hang. So for this 11 by 14 piece on the back, I have installed a wire hanger. I put some care tips on there for the future owner and I signed the piece. And one last step that I do with these white pieces is I do take them outside and spray them with an archival varnish that has a UV protectant in it. So this gives it a little added protection from any type of deterioration. So I hope you'll be able to visit Sproul Gallery sometime soon and see more of my work in person there. And in the meantime, I'd love to have you visit my Etsy shop and see some of my work that's available online. I also do have work at the Avalon Galleries at 5000 and 6000 Avalon Boulevard within the shopping area. So I hope to see you sometime soon. Take care.